Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Savannah Graziano? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Savannah Milan Graziano was born on November 15, 2006, in Fontana, California. She lived with her father, Anthony John Graziano, her mother, Tracy Martinez, and a younger brother. Savannah enjoyed video games, skateboarding, and camping. There was trouble in the marriage between Savannah's father and mother. Starting sometime around late August 2022, Savannah decided to live with her father instead of her mother and brother. She and her father lived in various motels and hotels. They also camped at local parks and lived in Anthony's white 2017 Nissan Frontier pickup truck. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On September 26, 2022, 45-year-old Anthony Graziano shot his estranged wife, Tracy Martinez, at their home in Fontana, California. He also shot at a father and a child who were near a school. Savannah was in the back seat of Anthony's Nissan Frontier when the shooting occurred. Tracy ultimately died from her wounds, but not before identifying her husband Anthony as the shooter. She did not make any mention of Savannah being there. At 1.30 p.m., an Amber Alert was issued out of concern that 15-year-old Savannah had been taken by Anthony in his Nissan Frontier. Savannah was last seen with her father at 7.34 a.m. On the next day, September 27, at about 10.25 a.m., multiple 911 calls were placed by witnesses who spotted Anthony's pickup truck west of Barstow, California. One of the callers was a clerk who worked at a pilot gas station and convenience store. He told the 911 operator that Savannah purchased two sodas and climbed into a Nissan Frontier. The pickup truck was driving east on Highway 58. Sheriff's deputies from San Bernardino County started searching for Anthony's truck and found it near Lenwood. The truck was being operated at an excessive speed, and it took the deputies quite a while to catch up with it. It was later determined that Anthony was the driver of the vehicle. Anthony took the on-ramp for Interstate 15 South and continued driving at a high speed. At certain points, he was traveling over 110 miles per hour. Just before 11 a.m., Gunshots were fired at the police from Anthony's truck. Several bullets struck police vehicles, and one of these vehicles was disabled. The pursuit on Interstate 15 South continued, and the speeds remained excessive. When Anthony reached Wild Wash Road, a California Highway Patrol helicopter arrived and started monitoring the chase. When Anthony approached the North Stoddard Road exit, a deputy reported that additional shots had been fired. They appeared to come from the passenger side window. A few seconds later, the helicopter crew reported that shots had been fired from the driver's side window. Near Palmdale Road, a witness recorded the pickup truck as the gunfire continued. This witness later said the gunshots were coming from the passenger side window. About 30 miles into the pursuit, Anthony was where Interstate 15 passes under Main Street in Hesperia, which is 80 miles east of Los Angeles. He decided that he wanted to exit there, but employed a very unusual tactic to leave the interstate. Instead of driving on the off-ramp to get to Main Street, like most people would do, he selected the on-ramp. His pickup truck was going the wrong way on the ramp. After realizing that the on-ramp was blocked, Anthony attempted to drive up an embankment onto Main Street, but his truck could not do it. Anthony rolled down the embankment towards several police vehicles that had stopped on the interstate as well as on the ramp. When the pickup truck came to rest, it was about 40 feet from the nearest police vehicle with the passenger side facing the front of the police vehicle. Savannah exited from the passenger side of the Nissan Frontier after she was directed to do so by the closest deputy. He was on the driver's side of the closest police SUV with other deputies running up behind him. After exiting the pickup truck, Savannah went to the ground. A California Highway Patrol officer could be heard on the radio saying, quote, Girl is out. 
The girl is out, guys. She's on the passenger side, unquote. The closest deputy continued to give Savannah directions. He told her to walk toward him. Savannah stood up and started walking toward the deputy. However, the police shot her before she made it to safety. She dropped to the pavement. The deputy who was directing Savannah could be heard telling the other deputies, quote, Stop. Stop shooting her. He's in the car. Stop. She's okay. He's in the car. Stop. Unquote. Unfortunately, the damage had already been done. The deputies provided medical assistance to Savannah before she was transported to a nearby hospital where she was pronounced dead at 11.52 a.m. Savannah's father, Anthony, was pronounced dead at the scene. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Initially, the police indicated that they didn't know who shot Savannah. It may have been Anthony. It may have been the deputies. Maybe both of them shot her. The police refused repeated requests to release video of the incident. Later, they indicated that Savannah was shot by law enforcement. They did not say how many deputies were involved in the shooting. The gunfire that killed Savannah came from one or more deputies who were at the higher elevation on the driver's side of the Nissan Frontier. The deputy who directed Savannah to come toward him and the other deputies near him did not fire their weapons. The deputies at the higher elevation saw Savannah moving toward the closest deputy, but they were unaware that this deputy was directing her to move toward him. They assumed that she was a threat, which is why they opened fire. The police said that Savannah was wearing tactical gear and a helmet, although it is not possible to verify this from the available video. Item number two, when Anthony was killed, he had two pistols, a rifle, hundreds of rounds of ammunition, flashbangs, smoke grenades, body armor, and tactical helmets. The police searched a home and storage facility connected to Anthony and found several AR-15 style rifles, handguns, ammunition, body armor, and smoke grenades. All the items were legally owned. It appeared as though Anthony was preparing to go out in a blaze of glory. Item number three, some people have argued that the police do not bear any responsibility for the death of Savannah Graziano. Clearly, that was the contention of the police initially and may ultimately be their position after their investigation is complete. Other people see this case much differently. They believe that the shooting of Savannah was uncalled for. Clearly, Savannah's father played a large role in her death, but were the police also responsible? Let's take a look at the factors both for and against the idea that the deputies involved in the shooting were partially to blame for Savannah's death, starting with the inculpatory factors. When Anthony's vehicle came to rest near Interstate 15 after his failed attempt to climb the embankment, the deputy closest to Savannah directed her to exit the vehicle. This was not a request. He was giving her an order. After Savannah exited, she went to the ground and probably would have stayed there without further directions from the deputy. This was not a safe place to be, considering other deputies were firing on the Nissan Frontier from the driver's side, but it was a lot safer than standing up and walking. The closest deputy directed Savannah to come toward him without ensuring that the other deputies knew what he was doing. This is what prompted one or more deputies from the higher elevation to shoot Savannah. They falsely believed that they were protecting a fellow deputy. Whoever shot Savannah did so despite her being unarmed. Savannah's movement toward a deputy was not justification to kill her. Moving to the exculpatory factors, Anthony murdered his wife and repeatedly fired at the police. He was clearly dangerous and willing to kill. It was reasonable for the deputies to fear for their lives and to use deadly force against him. During the high-speed pursuit, a deputy reported that gunfire was coming from the passenger side window a motorist reported the same thing and stated that he believed the person shooting was not the driver of the pickup truck. There were only two people in the truck. If Anthony was not shooting out of the passenger side window, then it was Savannah. The police said that Savannah was wearing tactical gear and a helmet. This, of course, would not justify shooting her, but it's understandable that the deputies may have interpreted this attire as consistent with aggression. Furthermore, this choice of attire could have led the deputies to believe that Savannah was Anthony. There was not a substantial size difference between the daughter and the father. 
Savannah was five foot two. Her father was only two inches taller. During the shootout with the police, Savannah was not safe in the Nissan Frontier. It was logical for the closest deputy to direct Savannah to exit the vehicle. Considering how Anthony was actively shooting at the police, the deputy may have believed that it was better for Savannah to make a break toward the police SUV as opposed to staying on the ground where Anthony could easily shoot her. Transmissions over the radio indicated that the girl was the one exiting from the passenger side of the Nissan Frontier. Maybe the deputy believed that all the other deputies understood this and it was safe for Savannah to move. At least she was safe from law enforcement. When considering all the evidence, do I think the deputies were partially to blame for Savannah's death? Yes, the deputy who directed Savannah and the deputy or deputies who shot her bear responsibility. The deputy close to her put her into a dangerous situation. Whoever shot her killed an unarmed teenager without sufficient justification. The scene of the shooting was chaotic and disorganized. Somebody needed to be in charge, and it did not appear as though anyone was. The police should have demonstrated better communication and followed their own use-of-force policy. That policy doesn't go out the window just because they're being fired upon. I don't believe that the behavior of any of the deputies rose to a criminal level. It's particularly clear that the officer who was directing Savannah did want to help her. He was not trying to get her killed. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. During a tumultuous separation from his wife, Anthony somehow convinced his daughter to be on his side. Furthermore, he convinced her to actively participate in the shooting during the high-speed chase. This is why she was wearing tactical gear and a helmet, and why two different people reported seeing gunshots from the passenger side of the Nissan Frontier. It's possible that Anthony was paranoid based on the items that he had collected, Perhaps this paranoia had transmitted to Savannah, like Anthony was able to convince her to be afraid of the police. After the truck was stopped, Savannah wanted to escape, and she followed the orders of the police. Just like it was a bad idea to follow her father's orders, it turned out to be a bad idea to follow the orders of law enforcement. Unfortunately, Savannah didn't have any choice. No one in the situation knew how to direct Savannah, to safety. Those are my thoughts on the case of Savannah Graziano. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.